We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Master Your Life, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining host and her guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here's your host, Leah Mattinson. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I'm host Leah Mattinson, and thank you so much to each and every one of you who've joined us from wherever it is you are on this beautiful planet today. Uh, I'm joined by my wonderful guest, Dr. David Hardy. Dr. Dave, how are you today? Oh, I'm fantastic, Leah. Yes, thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. And yeah, always fun, exciting topics to, to talk about. Exactly. You know what, what? And we want to dive into today is really talking about the new things that we're doing and new initiatives that each, you know, I'm sure everyone can relate to this. Everyone's probably got a new projects or things that they've started or things that they really ramp up at different times of year. You know, fall, September is often a time when we start new initiatives um, because it's, you know, kind of aligns up with school and the beginning of school for lots of people uh, and, you know, starting new athletic programs or making new friendships, going to new workplaces. So there's all of these changes that sort of happen seasonally and uh, areas of growth that we're, that people who are trying to master their life really are seeking as part of the adventure of their life. And you've been up to something uh, for the, <laughs> for the <laughs> past you know, four or five months or six months uh, in the background and working really diligently on and I wanted to take time this episode to actually talk about your new project uh, because I think what you talk about brings such value uh, to the world and I don't want people to miss out on the opportunity to actually hear what you're up to and uh, how they might be able to participate. So Dr. Dave, what is what have you been up to? <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, I, I've got to really thank you because you're kind of the catalyst behind this. Uh, after we did a couple interviews and and I've become more comfortable on the mic, I, I'm like, wow, Leah is really good at podcasting and has really developed uh, quite the audience. And it kind of just motivated me to start doing it myself and uh, launch, launched my own podcast, uh, The Hardy Brain. And kind of that first stage was to uh, just see how many interviews I could start, start to kind of accumulate. And, uh, and it's been an absolutely amazing experience that uh, I've been able to have all these conversations with, uh, with a lot of really strong leaders out there in such diverse fields in entrepreneurship, in coaching, in athletics, and in, in health and wellness as well. And uh, yeah, it's been extremely exciting and, uh, and really had, had once again, amazing conversations that, that a lot of people can latch onto and, and, uh, take into their lives as well. Yeah, well, and thank you for the compliment. It was very sweet. I'm just now, I'm, I'm embarrassed a bit, but yeah, Aww. that's just, it's very sweet. Thank you. I, it, yes, it's very, very sweet. What a nice compliment. And da and Dr. Dave actually totally got me because he, he tagged me on a post on LinkedIn and it was like, <laughs> whatever it was. So I'm reading this post and it's like 71% of people avoid conflict. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting post. So again, for people who are not connected with you yet, I want to encourage you to do that either on LinkedIn or by coming to the masteryourlife.ca website, uh, because it was this uh, really great tag, because I went, hmm, 71% of people avoid conflict. Am, am, am I part of that 71%? Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was. it's very, very funny to go that was a really insightful, a great question, a great way to pose a question. And so who was it you were interviewing on that, that podcast? That was with uh, Dr. Mark Goldston, who uh, has the book, uh, Just Listen, and then is uh, author or co-author in nine other books as well. And uh, 
he is the number one conflict uh, coach out there. And he's actually being contracted to FBI hostage negotiations and, and as just one of those people who, who really gets how people function and more so kind of how we can improve these situations. Because, yeah, in the, the business world, 71% of people being conflict avoidant is not a good thing to, um, it just makes for a lot of office tension and, uh, and especially with the added stress that's going on right now in the world, that this is a, a major major thing to, to be addressing. And he is just so articulate with his words, phrases, and strategies on how to just get people to come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's a really great guest when, because for me on the post too, I went, okay, where do I do that? And it, is it serving me? So I'm asking myself all these questions as a result of this really great post. And I went, oh, okay. So what conflict am I avoiding right now? that it would serve me to actually step through that conflict and do something about it. And, you know, right. I, so I wrote it down and I had, I have more than one. <laughs> so I'm yeah. just like <laughs> writing them down <laughs> and then the examination of, okay, well, how am I going to do that then? Like, how yeah. am I actually going to move through the conflict? So again, that's, that is what is compelling um, content is when people are moved to do something about what they read. So again, I just want to thank you for that really excellent post because it did make me take some action this week that I've been procrastinating on or sort of just not really not really contemplating how much it was costing me because the cost yes. of not dealing with the conflict is really significant like not, you know, not sleeping properly. What other examples did you guys come up with in your, I'm sure you talked about lots of examples, but. Oh, there, there's a ton. And of course he goes into, in his book, into family dynamics as well. <laughs> right. And of course that's probably the largest conflict avoidance most of us have is with our, with her family and, right. and loved ones. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, and, conflict uh, avoidance with ourselves too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that got me thinking too, because kind of my superpower is to come up with different neurological drills to, and to get my brain firing in the right direction to, and to set me up. And then I, I started thinking about my own conflict avoidance with this. And uh, then I started to develop these, these drills that, that I, I am uh, now going to integrate into my morning routine just to keep my brain firing and being being aware of these things so that I can prep myself. And then it's not one of these responses where conflict hits you and you go, uh, uh, or <laughs> you're stunned because in conflicts all around us and there's just no way we can avoid it. And yeah, uh, <laughs> 70, about three quarters of us would, would probably like to avoid it and, and get away from them, but they're, they're there. And, uh, and, uh, it's, it's something we need to tackle if we're ever going to, to kind of develop ourselves and, and be in those leadership positions where, where conflict is the majority of the things that we, we deal with then. So why do you, and let's just talk about this for a minute. It's striking me that, um, that children need to learn to deal with conflict early on mm -hmm. productively so that as adults, they have those skills already in place. So well-meaning parents and grandparents, including myself, <laughs> <laughs> maybe have, you know, uh, oversaved people or whatever it is so that they actually don't have good conflict. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying I have, but I'm not saying I haven't. <laughs> so, how do, so it's like these, yeah, the sabotaging of, of those, that natural skill development, because in nature, if we come up against a conflict and we're not successful navigating it, we die. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So what does the well-meaning parent do then or a grandparent when you see little ones just in terms of conflict? How do you, what do you, mm -hmm. what are good ways to um, use conflict to help people to grow skills? I think it goes a lot into these communication skills that, that Mark talks about in, in his book is that uh, basically developing a dialogue that then you start walking with each other instead of against each other. And uh, it goes a lot farther than just saying yes and no 
And uh, I think too, we've got to really kind of value the, that if a child's talking back to us, it's them starting to develop that assertiveness. And now, even though our ears might not like what they're saying or how they're saying it to us is to really then start to guide them on the path of actually articulating their words better and their phrases. Um, so it's, and also calming that emotional response down during these conflict situations so that it is assertiveness versus uh, a tantrum. And uh, yeah, that becomes a lot of skill and, uh, and energy on our parts as caregivers uh, for the little ones to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But in the end, you're going to set your child up for so much success in this world. If mm -hmm. they're the, one of the, the few that can, uh, navigate these situations effectively. And uh, yeah, I think we just have to smile and pat ourselves on the back if we're able to make even a little in inroads uh, during these huge tantrums. Um, and uh, I always remember too, um, another mentor I had in, uh, who does a lot with uh, autism, autistic spectrum disorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had one great success story where... Uh, where uh, uh, basically one of the parents comes up to him and, and says, my child lied to me yes. and was happy. <laughs> I was happy. <laughs> because finally they're developing these right brain skills where they're actually able to, to lie instead of kind of this on the spectrum skills where everything's logical, logical, logical and, and more left brain skills. Uh, so yeah, we need to, need to realize that, yeah, tantrums and, uh, arguments are actually, uh, part of that, that brain development and, uh, yeah. Right. What a cool example. I guess that we can't all be good and logical all the time, but no, the playing, uh, the playing right. between the left and the right side of the brain, right? It's like, the, yes. and there should be interplay between those two, the two, um, so talk to me, just share, where can people find your podcast? And uh, then let's talk about some other guests that you've had. Okay. Yeah, I'm on Spotify, Apple, and Google. And then you can also find me at The Hardy Brain and uh, look up The Hardy Brain podcast there as well. And, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely exciting territory and uh, excited to, and to share some of these great, great conversations with people. Yeah, very and so interesting. I think that uh, you had shared that one of your first guests was uh, somebody who talked about uh, the DNA of um, their own genetics around, um, you know, entrepreneurship and addiction. Yes, yeah, Kashif Khan was absolutely amazing guest, and uh, he's the CEO for the DNA company, okay. which is doing a. Uh, uh, functional genomics. And uh, so a little different than kind of this other test that, that you would see, see online is that they're actually going into how to support basically what they're finding with the genetics through supplementation and lifestyle. And instead of just kind of uh, farming the data and then selling it off to to whatever industry needs it. <laughs> and uh, they're doing some amazing things, but his journey was basically, yeah, he was in a family where there were functional addictions going on all around him. And uh, he, he kind of realized later when he got into this world with the, with the genomics and the DNA that, uh, yeah, there's different genes for dopamine. And uh, basically dopamine having such a large connection with, the, with addictions in that realm. And uh, he realized too that that part of, his own genetic makeup probably led him to kind of the entrepreneurial world is that uh, he was seeking that, that dopamine and uh, trying to support basically the, the too much dopamine or too little dopamine that, that can be right there stated in, in our genomics. And uh, then he also went into how kind of the, the point where he was at 
that really got him into this was they were in an office building where below them was basically a manufacturing, a small manufacturing area that was uh, producing chemicals. And these chemicals, of course, would go up and seep through the ventilation. And uh, his partner was fine. His business partner was absolutely fine and able to handle it. But he got extremely sick from it. And some of these genes that deal with detoxification were null. So they didn't exist. Interesting. So this kind of goes into how some people can handle mold and allergens or chemical mm -hmm. exposures and be able to rid themselves of it without having any issues or problems. But for himself and for a large chunk of the population, uh, you're not able to because that gene just isn't there. And you really need to start, start the supplementation processes and, and, uh, get in that glutathione and all the precursors that are going to help you out in detoxifying some of these nasty things because they're all around us. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's doing amazing, amazing work with, with this. And yeah, that was just another interview that I'm, I'm there asking these questions and curious because, uh, this is such an exciting realm of science that's coming up and that's, released now instead of waiting for it. Right. Yeah. I think it's very important to that uh, for people to have an understanding of their own vulnerability around environmental factors. And we often don't think about it because it's sometimes not visible, right? So you don't, yes. you don't necessarily see the toxins that are in your walls and you sometimes don't see the toxins that are in your food either. Yeah. right? Because you're not. And the other thing is your lab tests are probably going to be normal. <laughs> and then you're left feeling sick but right, let's talk about the yeah. why is that why is the normal lab test normal because it's not searching for everything okay. so um there, there's a lot of information that's left out of lab tests and uh especially with just standard panels that that healthcare systems run nowadays and uh being in the functional medicine realm as well was it, it amazed me how much uh, lab tests we would send out for and how much information we'd get back from it uh, versus now being back in, <laughs> in Canada and looking at the, the limited data that is actually provided with kind of the standard blood tests that are ran here. And uh, it doesn't go into kind of these functional things that, that would help you live a healthy life. It's, it's searching for a certain mm -hmm. level of pathology. And, uh, and by the time you have that, uh, it's, it's, yeah, you're, you're in the doctor's office, but uh, for everybody else who wants to live a healthy life or who has gone in and had normal panels, um, but still feel sick, mm -hmm. there's definitely something missing. And uh, I think this, this realm really answers a lot of those questions. Right. So that's one of the tools would be what this fellow has from the DNA company. Is that? Yes, that's correct. And do you, yeah. Does your Hardy Brain uh, coursework or Hardy, Hardy Brain program also include those kinds of assessments? Um, I look into a lot of kind of those areas so that people then can go out and, and uh, have that information of what to look for. Um, through a coaching course, I'm, I'm usually not able to order a whole bunch of panels, um, but some of these actually you can order yourself mm. and, and get, the, get the kits. And uh, like for DNA, it's a saliva test. So you just spit into a little vial and send it off in the mail and get the information back. And uh, you can do that too for, uh, for stool and urine, which uh, is also going to pick up different, different things. Um, there's a lot of uh, online hormone tests. And uh, sometimes it's more valuable to do the saliva one because it's, it's not bound to a protein like the, the blood tests are. So, uh, yeah, some of these kits are, are really, really advanced right. and, uh, 
the other great thing is, yeah, you can go online for a lot of these and, and order and, and pay for them yourself without uh, needing to go into, into a clinic. And um, is your information private when you do that? Uh, always check with obviously the companies that, that you're going with and, uh, and see, see once again, what their kind of, uh, core values are mm-hmm. and, and what they're striving for. Um, cause yeah, there, there have been, uh, especially kind of in the DNA realm, uh, companies that are, uh, actually selling the kits for less than, than what their expenses are, uh, because their end goal is to sell that data and information off. Um, and, uh, is that a good or bad thing? Um, it, it kind of depends on your, your, your values and, and what you're looking for as well. So always match those up, always look into them. Right. And I think that's a, it's a cool question too, because a lot of people maybe haven't even really thought about whether or not they want their DNA, you know, uh, known by anybody else for a number of reasons. So do think that through folks. <laughs> Do think that through and do ask that question. But so what, what was the name of the, what's the name of the fellow who that uh, interview uh, is the DNA company CEO. What was his name? That's, Just uh, so that people are looking it up. Just say it again. Kashif Khan. All right. Kashif, Kashif Khan. Say yes. that 10 times fast. <laughs> All right. And, and if I made a mistake with the name, my apologies. Yes, as well. We apologize. <laughs> in advance, but we do, I do want people to check it out because I know lots of people who are sick um, with things that they actually can't identify why they're sick. And it's it's just, you know, nice to have the toolkit of being able to go, what's actually going on here. And the other thing is you can get out ahead of your own health problems. You know, imagine if you knew that you were, that you really were addicted to something and it's a family trait. One of the things uh, we really want to encourage people always is kind of the seven generations planning. And if you were to end some particular thing that your family has, what would it be? You know, would it be obesity or would it be, um, you know, cataclysmic, whatever other health stuff that's right. going on? Cause often you can see it from generation to generation and, and yes, definitely. Yeah. So it's one way to, to end, end those stories. You've had some other pretty magnificent guests along this short venture. So who else can you talk about that you just think was a cool interview? Yeah, I've, I've had a few. So um, my first was with uh, one of my friends uh, uh, back in North Carolina, who is a former special uh, service um, in the U.S. military. Uh, and then uh, he went over to uh, Europe to help with the refugee crisis in, in the Ukraine so we talked about that performance and aspect and, uh, and just training basically and thriving in disaster zones. So being in these extremely high stress situations and, and what, what he needs to do for them. Um, I've interviewed uh, uh, athletes and uh, coaches. Um, so I've got, uh, of course, in the, being a former rugby player, then I've got got connections with these national and uh, high-performing athletes in that realm. Uh, I interviewed uh, Alicia Risling, who is a former uh, bobsled uh, pilot and uh, now uh, is uh, employed with the CHL and doing amazing work there. Uh, That was another great interview because Oh, she goes into basically the feelings and sensations of driving this sled down this bumpy, icy track at oh break breakneck speeds, and and of course the crashes and the the highs and lows that come with being a, an Olympic athlete as well. Um, in the leadership realm, uh, I've been able to have great conversations with very high level level people in, in that realm as well from Dan Silberberg, um, Dr. Oleg Kononov, Konolova, <laughs> my Russian's horrible, <laughs> Konolova. And uh, he, he was, oh, he's, he does, he's the number one vision uh, coach out there. So he's contracted to all these high level companies and people to help develop a, a leadership uh, vision that's going to lead companies and and people in these high realms into these these future situations now and uh 
yeah, he just is a wealth of knowledge when it comes, comes to that arena. Um, I had a really interesting interview with uh, the, the founder of Tobacco Free Earth. So uh, Patrick Reynolds is actually the grandson of RJ Reynolds of the tobacco family. So he, of course, had, had his lobbying and uh, still does, but uh, through basically the height of when tobacco was everywhere, mm-hmm. sold on planes and hospitals, <laughs> recommended <laughs> brands. Remember those camel ads, I believe. And, yes. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that was interesting to see kind of his approach and uh, how he was able to to kind of lobby and uh, get in there to disrupt this this, uh, this his family disrupt his family <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah, and kind of the conflict there. Um, talk about gr- green beret. <laughs> 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 yeah yes. not so covert not so covert <laughs> did he manage to stay in the family or did they boot him out um well actually his his mother was uh was basically partners with uh with uh the, the son of rj and uh they kind of had a had a fling, so he didn't actually meet his father until later yeah. in life as well. And uh, yeah, he goes into basically the challenges and how one of the first times he, he met him is his father's on a respirator from from his own product, right? Oh, and, uh, gasping for air and trying to fill his own lungs. Yeah, and uh, how that kind of just sat with him and motivated him to to make a difference in this world. Mm. Oh, yeah. Sad, even though the vill- it's just they, yeah, I still feel empathy for the whole situation, right? Just all of it. The purveyors of nasty stuff. I still feel sad that people get sick. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, there still is some humanistic aspect into everything. And uh, I think we've got to remember that and keep that empathy even. Even Contrary like, to popular belief, when you see that I have on here, I do have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> a black, black heart isn't as black as they thought. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. Fun, fun. I'm thinking about your bobsled interview and all of these um, very elite athletes. A lot of people go, well, that's not very relatable because I'm not an Olympic athlete or, you know, living a, you know, a high lifestyle of, of a ex- extreme athlete. Uh, but lots of times life is really like that, whether or not you, because it's difficult, life is difficult. So the athlete has just had time to prepare for things because they've had conflict in athletic competition, but in real life, I don't know anybody who hasn't had conflict of one kind or another. Oh, exactly. Um, yeah. Right. And that they've had to figure out how to, to tease out the good parts or tease out what they need to do to improve. And the advantage kind of, of athletics is that you can actually put yourself, your body through some physical things ahead of time to prepare you for how your body feels when it's in conflict. Uh, you know, something yeah, and, and you think you. about it, the, the way the brain works and to mm. develop a strong brain and nervous system, it's all about reaction time, mm. reaction to the questions, reaction to a response that somebody gives you, uh, reactions when driving, reactions when doing your daily tasks. It's all about basically how quick you can do that. And athletes have just trained themselves to be in that, oh, millionth of a second realm and be that advanced with it so we can all kind of learn from these training situations on how to improve our own brain and 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 functions and not just that all these other stressors that athletes have with transitions um, all of us are going to have career transitions and probably multiple times it's now a rarity where we don't Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of it becomes your identity your, your job, your work, your sport, all kind of become your identity. And then all of a sudden you wake up and one morning you realize you're, you're no longer that. 
and you need to find something else. So yeah, we kind of dived a little bit into, into those stressors as well and, and making kind of these transitions and uh, what that looks like and the, the pressures with that. And uh, yeah, she, she's just an amazing, <laughs> warm-hearted woman that, that will, will really, really describe and, uh, and talk about these, these with other people. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed talking, talking with Alicia as well. Right. So much fun. Breakneck speeds going down the yeah icy terrain. It reminds me of uh, being on the farm and having a ride, going for a horseback ride and this horse getting its uh, the bit in its teeth and it yeah. ran and just ran and ran and ran. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> and, you know, so where you see the romantic things on the movies where people are riding on their horses and looking so you know, ele- like it just looks elegant and strong and awesome and all that. That was not me. I was hanging on. <laughs> going, oh, Dear Lord. Life. Yeah. Help, me this, help me get this bit out of this gypsy's teeth. Cause <laughs> she was <laughs> me. Uh, so that prepared me for, you know, hanging on. Sometimes you just got to hang on <laughs> until the ride's <laughs> over. Cause eventually, <laughs> eventually she got tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah or until the until the sled or, or anything else just comes just comes to that halt <laughs> oh man yeah exactly very funny very funny but i do have lots of friends <clears throat> who are horseback riders who you know uh, love doing that the full out running and so i think that it's very akin to bobsledding to those breakneck speeds are really fast skiing uh you know downhill skiing so for people who haven't you know, been on the icy slopes, you might not have an easy time relating, but it might be a fun adventure for you to go and try to do, to do some of those things this upcoming uh, oh, definitely. season. <laughs> yeah. Like I always go back to my mountain biking because right now that's kind of the thing that, that I'll go out and do. And uh, I try to keep it in the limits. Um, but afterwards, after having all that exhilaration and those reactions to the curves the the bumps the the -hmm. jumps in some cases at at really (laughs) great amazing speeds is just how alive i feel afterwards Mm -hmm. and i i kind of say well if you're not doing something that makes you feel 10 years younger on a regular basis then you're going to age tens of years quicker (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you you really do have to find those things those hobbies those activities that make you feel alive, that stimulate the brain and nervous system and, and make, make you, make you fire at a different level. And, uh, I think that's kind of the important thing about, about watching sports and athletics is that you don't have to be at that level. Like, um, I'm not good at mountain biking. I, I do it cause I love it. And it's, it's a great enjoyment for myself. And then, uh, I really got more into starting to think about music with uh, with this group I'm in on Saturdays um, because there's a lot of musicianists in it, and uh, they're doing research on music and and the brain and uh, and they're going into very fine detail about how different frequencies of music and sound mm-hmm. will drive people into different moods and. Uh, that was just eye-opening for me too. And uh, I'm definitely not good at music, but now I'm like, well, let's do this because it's building these brain Mm -hmm. connections and making me feel more alive and enriching my life. So don't think you have to be good at anything to (laughs) stimulate your brain. In fact, the things you're probably worst at are the things you, you should start to find a way to enjoy and incorporate into your life, whether it's just in the car or the shower or whatever, is yeah. finding these little activities and things that, that stimulate the pathways that are weakest with you. And uh, yeah, we dive into so many of these conversations. I've got healthcare professionals on the show that, that uh, will state it more scientifically. And then of course, people that are out there doing this and just explaining how they feel about it and, and the rush they get. Right. And thanks for sharing that. I think that's a very uh, important uh, subject is how the effect of music or frequencies on people. 
And it's a lost uh, on a lot of people because they just think they can't sing or they can't express themselves. They don't want to open their mouth because they told their, you know, oh, you're out of tune, so don't sing. Right. But our yeah. basic, really basic um, nature is to hum, like humming or singing along with nature when we're out in nature. It's that. Um, so we vibrate at, with nature uh, very naturally. And it's only when we're kind of told, well, don't do that because you're, you know, don't open your mouth, don't do anything embarrassing, you know, right, silence yeah. yourself, be quiet. <laughs> but, ba you know, babies cry. That's the first sort of uh, letting out their expression of themselves. And exactly. there's a feedback loop created right then and there. And, yes. uh, so yeah, my people. friend uh, Steve Harms actually goes into that. So Steve yeah. is uh, an opera singer, and uh, yeah. I've got to get him on the show here shortly. Um, but he uh, he goes into that. He's like, well, you've got the voice you've got, and don't think you need to actually sing like, like the person singing the song. Be in your own voice. And then he also goes into basically, yeah, the first sound we make is by crying. And it's that... And then that ah uh, develops into oh yes. <laughs> and different musicalities, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's fascinating listening to him going to basically how music develops from a cry as we're we're young babies, and yes. uh, yeah, yeah, it's it is we're we're self healing units. So Absolutely. You know, people go, yes. oh, like it's whatever the frequency of this, that I go, you're, you have every frequency within you. And if you just mm -hmm. open up your mouth and do a little, ah, or whatever, it doesn't even have to be in tune. <clears throat> you're giving yourself feedback right away. Actually, if you're not well, uh, and mm -hmm. you are somebody who sings, you're, you will be able to tell that by the tone yeah. that you emit. So again, that's why I love, love Qigong is because we do healing sounds in Qigong. And I love these yes. Itera care devices that, um, because they are that the, the frequency of healing. So you can feel and hear that, like the sound uh, of healing, essentially elevation and healing. We're also susceptible to music that is not that great too, by the, right. <laughs> right. That there's, and there's some tones that are meant to scratch up old methods, like old uh, thoughts and patterns. So there's these, you know, sawtoothed looking, uh, notes that when they're played in a sawtooth manner, it actually helps to scratch up old messaging for in neurologically. So it can be quite powerful that way too. But yeah, I love, and it was, so when we started the show, you started sharing about that one of the ways that you were fixing this conflict um, problem or problem of not getting into conflict was that you were practicing with music. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Basically I, I, uh, <laughs> And the, the dork I am started to <laughs> dissect it even even farther. I'm like, well, yeah, somebody walks up to you and says something, it's just sound. Mm -hmm. Well, is that sound interpreted as being pleasant or negative? Okay, well, we all have those sounds. <laughs> and right. then I'm like, well, what's your initial response to that sound? Do you get drawn to it or do you get pushed away from it? And how do you change that? So if it's a negative sound, What's your first reaction? Is it to uh, run or to frown and face it? And so what I did was I just put together a soundtrack of different sounds and then plop myself in front of a mirror. And I'm like, well, your initial response is going to be facial expressions and body posturing before you speak. So I'm like, okay, well, let's just get that reaction to this stimuli. And I just plop myself in front of the mirror with these sounds and would either frown at the negative ones or make an assertive look, calm, assertive, and stand there. Or with the pleasant sounds, I'd go into a smile. And these would be at different intensities. And then I'd just kind of mirror myself and, and get these initial reactions. And one of the cool things with this as well is not only was I able to react better, and mm -hmm. this is only after doing it a couple times, was that I found too with the negative sounds, you get stuck into being in that negative frown emotion if something bad happens to you or, or is interpreted as, as being that conflict situation, you stick there longer. So then having this quick ding or something positive uh, and having to go into a smile 
trains you to get out of that frown and get out of that state of, <laughs> and, uh, not be stuck there in that negative frown and during these conflict situations as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's something I'm, I'm looking to, to share with a lot more people there too, because I think that's just a great exercise because how many of us are in these situations where we're like, Oh, I should have done this instead. Uh, I should have said this. Um, Oh, and then just perseverate on it after that situation's over and done with. And that doesn't do us any, any good because chances are by the next conflict situation, time has passed by where we go back into our regular mode. And uh, yeah, so doing these little drills and activities are things that I build up in, in my hearty brain program to, to get people to overcome the challenges with their own nervous system. Mm -hmm. And let's be even more nuanced, uh, or I'd ask more about like, what's your body position when you're doing the mirror work? Like, are you sitting down? Are you looking at a small mirror? Are you standing up and looking like in your bathroom mirror so you can see your full body? Mm -hmm. Or like, well, how is it that you actually approach it? The best is going to be a full body mirror if you can stand and posture with the facial expressions. But yeah, even if you just have like a TV turned off TV screen in front of you that has a almost a reflection to it, just something that you can practice in. And it's about the repetition. Right. Um, so ideally, yeah, full body mirror, but uh, the focus would be on doing it regularly. So you actually build these habits and routines and reactions. And then you can, can buy the, the books with the articulations, the phrases and the strategies to really kick butt. And, uh, and then it becomes this one plus one equals 3000 type thing. Right. And you can write the book on the affirmations that you want to say to yourself. For those of you who are listening to us on the podcast version, I just want to encourage you to come over to the masteryourlife.ca website so that you can watch the video version of this podcast. And then you can check out Dr. Dave's, um, background, the hardy brain, uh, you know, um, anatomical structures behind him and you can see his <laughs> fabulous beautiful office and uh you can check out my background uh, also because in mine i actually have a mirror uh, and i keep a mirror there about head height so that i can actually look over at myself and do ex exercises between podcasts or between work so it's one of my strategies also i usually have a guitar too in my back uh, room but i've been playing it lately because i've got my hand fixed up so um, music's important, but this is the environmental question. You know, we were talking about the environment being toxic or not toxic. What do you have in your environment that could be helping you to be um, clear, clear thinking, uh, more healthy, more alive without getting the fire going too hot, um, but with being able to manage getting fired up enough that you are able to contend with the conflicts in your life, whether created by yourself or by yeah, others. And the, and so I know you've got to go, Dave, right? Are we out of time for today? Let's take a look here. Oh, yeah, you've got to go. You've got to go. Any final words? I tune into the Hardy Brain, the show that takes athletic, introverted entrepreneurs and leaders and transforms them into ironclad brain performers. Perfect. And definitely master your life as well. I love this show and I love being being a guest on it. So thanks again. And thank you for, for motivating me. And, and getting my podcast up off the ground as well. I appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Dave. We'll talk soon, everybody. Until next week, love yourselves, love each other, mind your minds. That's all for us. Bye for now. Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life is a presentation of Leah Mattinson Enterprises, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.